Good morning and welcome to Sydney for the fourth annual Building Better City Summit. This year's summit is, is titled Housing Australia's Future. Today we'll ask some very important questions about Australia's capacity to house our population in the future. We'll explore the consequences if we do not meet this challenge and we'll consider some of the policy responses that are, that are required. Access to appropriate and affordable, affordable housing is an issue that impacts on every Australian, everyone living in this beautiful country. I would like to welcome especially today our panel of speakers, delegates and invited guests, members of the Housing Industry Association, HA board members, HIA board members and regional presidents and representatives of the media. I'd also like to extend a, a special warm welcome to Shadow Treasurer Joe Hockey, who has taken time out of what would be an extremely busy schedule to be join us here today. The housing industry is currently building 25,000 homes less than we did a decade ago, and that's 10,000 homes per year less than the recent average. Under current population projections, projections we need to build 1.3 million homes by 2020 to meet demand. Yet at the present rate of building, Australia will fall conservatively 150,000 dwellings below that target. And there's not much light at the end of the tunnel. The industry has been constrained by dis disproportionately high levels of taxation, the burden of red and green tape, and an infle inflexible industrial relations system. These are just some of the reasons HIA is embarking on our Housing Australia's campaign in this election year. Housing Australians is elevating housing in the national debate and also provides a blueprint of ideas and actions to address some of the problems facing our industry. There are options for the future, for future government and I expect we will see some today. They, much, they, they are much better than the preferable, they are much more preferable than the alternatives. We are joined today by a dis distinguished list of guest speakers. They have all given up their time to join us and I offer them all a heartfelt appreciation for being here and sharing their wisdom and insights with us. Likewise, we are very fortunate to have with us today one of the nation's most respectable political journalists, our Master of Ceremonies, Jim Milliton, who has uh, no doubt take us through this, the summit and keep us all in order. Again, thank you for your attendance at the Housing Industry Association's 2013 Building Better City Summit and look forward to sitting with you today in the audience and sharing today's discussion. Thank you very much. HIA did invite uh, representatives of both the uh, government and the opposition to attend today's summit. Shadow Treasurer Joe Hockey not only accepted the invitation but also offered to speak. Mr Hockey has been the member for North Sydney since 1996. In the Howard government he held a number of portfolios, financial services, small business, human services and probably most importantly employment and workplace relations towards the end of the period of that government. Since 2009 he has been the shadow treasurer. He has walked the uh, Kokoda track uh, with Kevin Rudd, helped save his life uh, when he got into trouble in the, in the waters on the way up. He's also climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and uh, if the coalition does win the election that will have seemed like a small challenge by comparison with what lies ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Shadow Treasurer Joe Hockey. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and to you, Ron, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, come and speak today. As someone who has been involved with the property industry for all my life, I know how significant confidence is for the market. Obviously, the balance between supply and demand is crucial. And I know there are many influences on supply, such as land release, timely approvals, and affordable construction costs, including, as you identify, the impact of tax. I also know that there are many influences on demand, 
such as affordable and accessible credit, low unemployment and good job security, as well as a reasonable level of immigration. But it is confidence that binds all the fundamentals together. And we'll never have a return of confidence whilst the broken and dysfunctional Labor Party is running the country. Events in Canberra are not the normal. And I do want to begin by touching on these events today because they affect your industry and they affect your business. And they directly affect the confidence of consumers as to whether they can go out and borrow against their job, against their income, in order to buy housing stock. We could be forgiven for thinking that in 2013 we are back to the future. In 2010 we had one Prime Minister who was elected but discovered months out from the election would be voting for another. And in 2013, only months out from the election, the Prime Minister has been changed again, back to the one we elected in 2007. Who knows who will be Prime Minister if Labor wins again? One thing's for sure. If Kevin Rudd is re-elected in a few weeks' time, he won't be there three years. The faceless men will be back. The instability will continue for another three years. The dysfunction will continue. And the only way that Labor can be re-elected is on green preferences, with the support of the Greens, who have been the obvious opponent the committed enemy of development in Australia. With the return of Kevin Rudd to the Prime Ministership, the Labor Party wants to take you back to the halcyon days of Kevin 07, the election campaign. They hope you'll forget the chaotic days in 2010 before Mr Rudd was brought down by his disloyal deputy. But whether it's 2007 or 2010, they want to take us back to the future. It seems now Australia has two oppositions but no government. The new Prime Minister is promising a fresh start on a whole range of policy areas, conveniently forgetting what's happened over the last six years. And the government can't run on its record. They can't run on the record of the old Rudd government because the party, their own party, thought it was such a poor government they knifed the Prime Minister. And they can't run on the record of the Gillard government because their own party acknowledged it was such a failure that they replaced Mr. Rudd, uh, Ms. Gillard with Mr. Rudd. So I'd say to you, ladies and gentlemen, they can't run on what they've done over the last six years because of policy failures. They say it's a sell job failure, but it's a policy failure, and the Australian people know it's policy failure, whether it's a uh, failure to stop illegal maritime arrivals, cost blowouts, from the mining tax, faltering economic growth, continuous budget deficits, ever-rising government debt, decreased competition in banking, and the list goes on. I don't believe the Australian people will fall for the tactic again. The Australian community is desperate for an election. They want to get on with the job. Ms Gillard came to office promising to fix Mr Rudd's problems. She promised to stop the boats to fix the mining tax and promised not to introduce a carbon tax. Instead, boat arrivals have increased. Now more than 45,000 people have come on boats at a cost to the budget of over $10 billion. The mining tax has been an abysmal failure. All it's done is hit confidence in the mining industry without raising, without raising any revenue, which is the worst possible tax you could have. It sends a message to the world don't invest here, we've got this new additional tax, and then the tax fails to actually raise any money. But what it does is it has a huge negative impact on investment sentiment, and it complicates the investment equation. And of course, uh, the carbon tax, which uh, a number of you have raised already today, uh, the impact that's had on cost of living, but also on construction costs. Now, Mr Rudd says he's going to fix all of that. Well, we've heard that before. It hasn't worked in the past, won't work now. So what's the impact of these political events on the economics that affects your business? Well, the new Rudd government 
has said it's going to be fiscally responsible. It's going to be responsible with the budget. And I note today, uh, after uh, the uh, new Treasurer, Chris Bowen, had been refusing to back the budget numbers last week, he's now backing the budget numbers and saying that any new expenditure is going to be offset by savings. Well, that's not what his Prime Minister said. And that's added to the confusion about the state of the budget. So yesterday we had a spine stiffener from the Governor of the Reserve Bank. A spine stiffener, and it's rare for the Governor of the Reserve Bank to go out there and say, hang on guys, you've got to remain committed to a surplus. It's rare for him to be so overtly political. But he is concerned, like the rest of the nation is concerned, that Kevin Rudd is going to go on a credit card spending spree in order to try and win the upcoming election. And now, after the event, the new Treasurer has said, yep, I'm getting on that bandwagon, we've got to be fiscally responsible. The challenge is that Mr Rudd has always talked about fiscal responsibility, but he's never actually delivered it. And they know that. Credit card Kevin, we call him. He's fantastic. He's run the biggest deficits in modern Australian history accumulated the biggest debt in modern Australian history. But challengingly, the net result is that he goes out there and says, I want to be fiscally responsible. I want to have a debate with Tony Abbott on debt and deficit. That's what he says. It's all show. It's all fake Kevin. This is the campaigner that he wants everyone to believe. But when he is actually the Prime Minister, when he actually has to run something, he runs 100 miles away from the rhetoric. The fact is it's much harder, much harder to be fiscally responsible than it is to actually say it or to promise it. And that's the challenge. Now when you get into the nuances of what this latest government is suggesting, you start to peel back the truth. Now Wayne Swan had a rule was pretty meaningless because he never kept to it, but he had a rule called a fiscal rule. And he said the government will deliver surpluses on average over the economic cycle. The economic cycle is meant to be three to five years and it's been pushed out to ten. Now I think it's more a millennium. That is, you know, they'll get there eventually. But he said at least on average we will have surpluses. Because if you are not running surpluses when you have growth at around trend, if you are not running surpluses when you have unemployment with a five in front of it, and if you are not running surpluses when you still have uh, amongst the best terms of trade in 100 years, when do you live within your means? And the Australian people know this. The Australian people know this because they themselves are saving with savings rates at near record highs at the moment. They're not prepared to go out and spend so aggressively because they know they have to live within their means. And they know the government has to live within their means. And that's why if the government is determined to get back to surplus and actually delivers on its words, then it gives confidence to consumers that we can manage that risk of going out and borrowing more money, getting a bit of credit growth into the economy, renovating the home, maybe upgrading the home. It gives them a bit of confidence if they know that there's not going to be another left field tax that hits them tomorrow, or if they know there's not going to be another tax that hits their employer tomorrow, which undermines their job security. It's all swings and roundabouts. That's the bottom line. So Wayne Swan said, don't worry, we'll get back to living within our means on average over the cycle. But in the last few days, the new Treasurer has crab walked away. He said, look, we'll get to surplus at some point over the cycle. Not on average, but at some point we'll get there. And Penny Wong, the Finance Minister, who's been around for a while, and it wasn't a slip of the tongue from her. I thought I was giving Chris Bowen the benefit of the doubt as a new Treasurer. He has his training wheels on. I thought I'd give him a chance. Really, he just got it wrong. But then Penny Wong came out and said the same. Penny Wong said, well, maybe we can get there. This is the instability we are living with now. And the instability will not be resolved until there is an election. And the problem for Labor is they can't be stable going forward because they haven't been stable over the past. 
I just want to remind you, because this is what your clients know. This is what they know. In just six years, there have been six ministers for small business. Six ministers in six years for small business. In fact, five ministers for small business in the last 15 months. There's been six ministers for housing in six years. Six ministers for Centrelink and Medicare. Five assistant treasurers in six years. They're the people that are meant to run the tax system changing the rules. Five different ministers in six years. There's been four ministers for immigration, four ministers for trade, four ministers for sport, but get a load of this. There have been nine ministers for education in six years. 